Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Using Next-Gen Tools for Advancing Your Family History Research. My name is Ginevra Morse, Director of Education and Online Programs here at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be moderating today's event. We are a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Our presenter today is genealogist Melanie McComb. Uh, Melanie assists library visitors both on site and online with their family history research. She is a frequent speaker at regional and national conferences and has presented uh, during a number of our online courses and online programs. Her areas of research interest include Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, Kansas, Prince Edward Island, Quebec, and Ireland, and she is experienced in DNA, genealogical technology, and social media, Jewish genealogy, and military records. So perhaps contrary to popular belief, genealogy is not a solo effort. It's critical to the success of your research to connect with family and distant relatives, to find fellow researchers who can help you tackle brick walls, and to continue your to continue your genealogical education. And in recent years, uh, there have been you know, several online tools that have emerged to assist family historians um, to both forge and foster those connections. Today, we'll, providing, we'll be providing an overview of how social media, online DNA tools, communities, and other online resources can help you advance your understanding of your ancestors and make connections with family and genealogists worldwide. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question in the panel to the right of your screen. We'll address those after the presentation. Also, there is no handout uh, for today's session, but we are recording this event and starting tomorrow, you can easily go back and review any of the content from the presentation on our website. So if you miss something on the first listen, uh, don't worry, you can always review the presentation later. All right, so without further ado, I will turn things over to Melanie. Okay, thank you, Ginevra. I'm so happy to be here to speak about this topic. This was actually one of the first few topics that I started developing as I started moving into my role as a professional genealogist based on my experiences. So I hope to be able to share some success stories that, that I have as well as with others to help advance your family history research. So before we begin and, and jump right in, I wanted to take a look at this excerpt. This is from the genealogical pages of the Boston Evening Transcript newspaper. This was a column where readers could submit genealogical inquiries in hopes of gaining assistance from other genealogists. So when this happens, readers could then uh, review the inquiries that came in and submit letters back to the editor noting the inquiry number, as you see here. Um, so in this case, there's like 1715 would be the inquiry number and reference to go back. So this was a way to do some collaboration uh, uh, between other researchers that might be looking at the same family tree. So this was the, uh, the precursor to the online forums that we see today. So as we see, collaboration has really always been there. It's just moving into a different format with the use of technology. So when we talk about next-gen tools, um, we, we need to talk about what that means before we can jump right into uh, the different types. So coming from an IT background, we've always relied on using the latest technology to make our current processes for businesses easier. And this can translate very well to genealogy because now we have technology to take our research forward and make it more efficient. We can find ways that we can make research uh, faster, quicker, and even cheaper to, to research now that we have ways to access information remotely. So now we're relying on using more web-based tools versus ones that were solely in print, like we saw in the newspaper example. So the first item we're gonna talk about today is social media, which has been a valuable tool that's been growing ever since uh, I, I started uh, in college. 
So let's talk about why we use social media. And the biggest question we get is like, what, why, what is the point of it? Is it actually useful? Is it a waste of time just to watch videos and pictures? And it really is a valuable tool because it is real time access to other users. And in this case, to other genealogists that are researching. And you can connect with other genealogists um, on a particular area, uh, region, even down to a surname to help gain some assistance and be part of this community. And because it's real time, you're getting the feedback right away. So you could be writing this at eight o'clock at night or even three in the morning. And there's likely somebody up in the world in a group that's gonna respond to, to your, your post or your tweets and give you some feedback. And it's also a valuable tool to uh, keep up to date with what's going on. So if you're not able to attend a conference like Roots Tech, um, FGS, NGS, uh, Jamboree, et cetera, uh, these are, this is a great way to keep up to date with what's going on in the field because people will typically use uh, social media to share updates from conferences. So you might see quotes from known speakers like Blaine Bettinger or Judy Russell and be able to see what they're thinking on a particular topic. And it also keeps you up to date with some of the latest news. So with the use of DNA, for example, being used in criminal investigations, we're starting to see a lot of updates to our platforms to help you make more, a better and more informed decision on how you wanna use it. And then of course, it's a, new, it's a way to learn new skills. Um, there's a way that you, know, you can learn uh, different ways to conduct research with other genealogists, whether you're looking at uh, land and probate, or maybe even learn how to use the next indexing feature available through Family Search. There's always something new that you can pick up in social media by connecting with others. And then, of course, we make new friends. I, I have lifelong friends that I have um, that I've made uh, via social media, and then eventually actually met up with in real life. And a lot of them are actually coworkers today. So it is a, a community that is a great one to tap into. So when we talk about social media, there are five main platforms that we're going to discuss today. And there are a few others, but these are the, the most popular ones that are used. And they are Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and YouTube. And we're gonna discuss these in detail. So starting off with Facebook, uh, this is one of the most popular and one of the oldest social media platforms. Uh, this rose uh, back when I was in, in college, I'll show my age a little bit. and Originally, it was meant to be a community for other, for your peers at a particular college. So you would have to actually be invited into Facebook to connect with others. When Facebook started becoming public, now the access to information has really grown. And instead of just communicating with your peers, you could communicate with people all across the globe. And when, as Facebook started to evolve, we started to see items like Facebook groups arise. Now a group is really just a community that you can join and you can learn um, different uh, techniques about genealogy um, or even any topic really. But talk about genealogy specifically, you know, looking at how do you, get, how do you find a particular record in a particular location. They can be specialized uh, for, let's say, um, as Ginevra mentioned, I do a lot of research with Prince Edward Island. So I'm, I'm a member of the Prince Edward Island genealogy group and when I connect with others, I'm talking with other people that are interested in that particular location. So it's a way to narrow down. But you can also do general groups. You can look at like Jewish genealogy, Irish genealogy, uh, DNA, which is definitely a bit of a learning curve. So it's, it's definitely created the need to learn more about how you can use DNA. Um, even like methodology. So using things like the genealogical proof standard, um, how do you use citations? Uh, staying organized. Uh, maybe you're even doing like a genealogy do-over and you're trying to uh, go back and actually, you know, recreate the research and start to do it a different way. And then there's even uh, items that we call surname registries that started popping up over the last few years. A few years back, I had actually started one for England. It was actually the English surname registry. And the idea was that you could submit a surname in your family along with your email address for contact um, and a basic location within England. So if you had a county or a town, something that would help differentiate your, your Smiths and Browns uh, versus someone else's. 
And what would happen is those registries would then compile all the entries that would come in on a weekly or quarterly basis. And you could actually go in and review the files and see if maybe you connect with another researcher and use their email to reach out. So Facebook groups can have really grown. And if you're ever not really sure what Facebook group you want to join, uh, Catherine Wilson, who is the founder of socialmediagenealogy.com, she created a huge PDF file of Facebook groups. And these are organized by location and categories. So you can really drill into what genealogy groups exist for a particular area if you want to have a place to start. And I highly recommend using it because it's a great way to see what's out there and new groups are getting added all the time. So it's a good way to keep track of what, what uh, Facebook groups might be helpful for your research. And with groups, um, since uh, a lot of people might have, might have privacy concerns, uh, there are a couple different levels that can be set up. So when you join a group though, uh, if you join a public group, for example, this means that anybody can join the group and anybody can see your posts in a group, even if they are not a member. And most groups in, face, uh, in Facebook, especially in genealogy, they tend not to be public. And the reason why is there could be very personal information that could be discussed, and we don't need to have everybody you know, looking at everything we've discussed. And in some cases, it just might be that people would just rather have that format of having it closed off to only genealogists because maybe your friends that view your feed on Facebook, maybe they don't always want to see your genealogy posts. So most likely they're going to be in a closed group. So with a closed group, that means that uh, the pub, the, your friends are not going to see your posts in there. They have to be members. And with that, you also have to request to join. So you're not automatically invited in as with a public group. You have to actually request, and most groups are requiring that you answer some questions, and they just want to make sure that you're a real person, that you're not a, a bot, and that you're actually um, going to be doing genealogy, and that you know you have good intent what you're doing, and that your research is actually applicable for the group to make it most successful. The other type of group uh, that is set up is secret, and this means that it's similar to closed, but you can't actually find these groups by just searching on Facebook. You have to actually be invited to a secret group. So it's kind of like a secret society, so to speak, but it's a way to just help enforce more privacy when you need a particular group that just needs a little more privacy closed off. So for example, um, a historical society board may have a secret group that is just for that board that they don't want anybody else to try to request to join because they're gonna be discussing the business of the society. So another way, if you want to look for groups, I recommend using the top toolbar um, up here with my, have by the Facebook logo. So in this case, I'm searching for Ireland genealogy. So I wanna look for all groups that are related to Ireland genealogy. And by doing this, I have a, a small set of results here. And as you can see, I have a couple of general ones and I also have a couple of county specific ones. So I can use this as a way to test to see what records, sorry, what, what groups are out there that I may want to join. And, you know, so you want to look at your keywords that you're using when you're searching for groups uh, to, to see what be the most applicable. And this is a way to kind of test drive what's out there. And as you can see here in this top toolbar, I'm actually filtered for groups. So you can actually filter this for other, when we get to talk about pages um, or videos, if you wanted to look at other items, but for groups specifically, you want to uh, filter on groups first and then do a search. Now, one of my success stories that I have with, with using groups is I recently had a reunion with a couple of third cousins that I had collaborated with on social media. I actually met, uh, I actually talked with one of the, one of the women's mothers through the family search one tree, one family tree, and we got in touch and we're exchanging emails. And at some point we actually moved over to Facebook and we continued to correspond on Facebook. And then her daughter decided to message me and then it kind of snowballed. And then we started to get another cousin that reached out to me all through Facebook. And because of that, we were able to were able to share all these different stories. And as a result, we actually met up uh, just a few weeks ago. And if you read my Vita Brevis post that I, this was published yesterday, you could read more about their reunion. 
And one of the things that came out of that reunion was I said, let's start a Facebook group. So we now have a family group set up for the descendants of Haya Goldman and Herman Siegel um, of Romania. So we can actually correspond and keep in touch with each other and also in hopes of discovering new cousins that we can find others. So this could be a great new way to um, start your own homestead group that you can invite other family members in, um, share different things that you're finding through your genealogy, and maybe even plan that next reunion about when you're all gonna meet up. So it's definitely been a valuable tool. Now a tip I have here when you're using Facebook is that you wanna make sure that you're summarizing what you know and what you're looking for. You wanna to get to the point. You don't wanna make your post read like war and peace. Because unfortunately, if your post is too long, it's not gonna get a lot of comments and you may not get the help you need versus if you had summarized it. So let's look at an example of a Facebook post that I put together. So this was a case of, I put a, a Facebook group, uh, a Facebook post together in uh, the Prince Edward Island genealogy group I mentioned. And in this case, I was trying to get some help with some of my brick wall ancestors. So my third great grandparents, uh, Francis Doherty and Catherine Clerken, and here's what I summarized. I can't find their parents' names. Here's what I know. Francis Doherty was born in 1802 in County Monaghan. He married Catherine Clerken, about, born about 1810 in Tidevnet, County Monaghan. Francis died in 1892 in Banner Township, Elmo, Dickinson County, Kansas. And Catherine died around 1881 in Prince Edward Island, Canada. Can anyone help me find out the parents' siblings for Francis and Catherine? So I've given a lot of information in just a few sentences. I've given the key names, I've given some dates, and I've given locations and including, and including countries as well too. So when you're talking about anything that's maybe outside of the US or Canada or where the, the primary group is, you wanna make sure you spell out if there's any other countries as well. So keep that in mind when you're doing your post to try to find a way to succinctly get to the point about what your, your query is. Now, another feature that's on Facebook is Facebook pages. Now, these are different than uh, Facebook groups in that these are managed typically by a person or a company, and they're used to publish posts. So the posts that are done are, are public information. So usually they're sharing maybe an update on a new service. Maybe there's a blog post that came out um, or, or there's just um, maybe even a troubleshooting uh, note just saying, you know, we're working on an issue. So it's really not a way to, uh, to necessarily collaborate with others in, in, on a page. You may be able to collaborate with the particular company so for example, Ancestry.com has a Facebook page and they actually have a tab that you can actually submit um, questions or issues as another way to resolve customer support. So some companies will do that where they'll allow you to actually you know, submit questions to them, but you're not necessarily collaborating with people in there. There might be people that comment after you, but they're not generally looking at all your comments when you're looking at an issue. So a lot of companies are doing this today where they're, where they're having these updates and uh, even American, Ancest American Ancestors also has our own page, um, Genealogy Societies, and even down to the local historical societies that you see around you are starting to use more Facebook pages to publish information. And even if you're a blogger, a lot of bloggers will even um, have a page up. So it's a way to follow a particular person or company without necessarily friending them back. So let's move on to the next social media platform. We're gonna talk about Twitter, and you see the big blue bird up here. And Twitter is mostly a, a public platform in that you can make your tweets, or as we, as we call them, or your posts private, you can protect them, but mostly people that use Twitter are making these posts public. They're meant to be shared, liked, commented on, versus if someone had sent out a and change their privacy to be protected, they, they can't be shared. Those, those tweets cannot be shared with anybody else. And that's their way of restricting a little bit of privacy there. But what's great about Twitter is, again, similar to Facebook, is that you basically can jump right in and you can work with other genealogists on your brick walls and ask a question to your group and of people that follow you and see if maybe they can help with, uh, with your question. So one question I saw uh, someone posted, they, they wanted to know 
how how useful it was to use Pinterest, for example. So like, it's like, 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 what is the purpose of using Pinterest for genealogy? And we'll get to that in a moment about how to use Pinterest. And people could, could jump in and answer questions. And sometimes you'll find that topics like these will typically go into more of a tweet up. So a tweet up means that it's a set date and time where we're gonna talk about a particular topic. So let's say, let's keep with Pinterest. We're gonna talk all things Pinterest. And when these tweet ups, they're gonna use a particular hashtag, or in this case, you'll see the pound side, uh, like this one, like pound side gen chat is one particular tweet up. They meet on Friday, um, every other Friday uh, at 10 p.m. Eastern to discuss a particular topic. And what people will do is uh, they'll have a, a question and answer, and we'll show you an example in a minute, what that looks like, and you basically use your hashtag to respond back. There's also other ones like Ancestry Hour, which operates um, on UK time on Tuesdays. So that, that's another way to get in touch with other genealogists is by attending tweet ups on particular topics. And then in addition to tweet ups, there also are genealogy challenges. So there could be a particular one like Amy Johnson Crow has one called 52 Ancestors. 52 Ancestors is a challenge to send out uh, prompts to talk about a particular uh, topic and you don't necessarily have to even tweet. You could blog, you could just post an image, you could even just talk to your family and the idea is to document something in your in your family tree. And a lot of people will actually document it through social media as a way to share with others something you've done. So, and the prompts can be very general. They could be something like a um, wedding and maybe someone has a wedding story that they're gonna share and they would add on hashtag 52 ancestors and share their wedding story. So let's look at an example of a post on Twitter. So here's an example that I had done of about a year, year ago and this was regarding the digital project that is taking place to recreate the public record office in Ireland which was basically completely destroyed um, by explosion and fire in Dublin. And because of this project, it, it was, I thought it was really interesting to share what was going on. And what's happening is that um, the, as part of the project, they're trying to show records that survived in addition to substitute records that should be consulted. And the idea is at the end, you're actually gonna be able to go into a website and actually almost like virtually walk around what the place might've looked like, uh, what it looked like at the time and, and be able to see different collections. So it's a way to feel like you're, you're part of that building, even though a lot of the original records are gone and show you still what records you could create though. But as you've seen here in Twitter, I'm going, I'm sharing a post. I try to share an image when possible to make it more appealing for people to look at. And as you see, I'm adding the hashtags uh, here. So I'm using things like hashtag genealogy, hashtag archives, hashtag family history. I'm using um, these kind of like general subjects to organize posts. And the reason why is that these hashtags are actually searchable. So you can actually search on these in Google or even within the platform to try to find posts that are on a similar topic. So now if we look at uh, GenChat, so this is what GenChat looks like. So very similar, uh, GenChat, and in this case here, we usually get like a question. There'll usually be like a slide similar to this, where in this case, we were searching for genealogy information on Pinterest. So how do I search for genealogy information on Pinterest? And you would basically respond back with your answer, and you would just make sure you would add on hashtag GenChat at the end of your post. Um, just to make sure that people can see it. And some people will actually put the hashtag in the beginning um, because uh, mobile applications will actually generally pick up the, the hashtags in the beginning of the post. Uh, otherwise, this one doesn't always display. But this is a way to keep in touch with others on a particular topic um, at this time. So it, it's a lot of fun. I really recommend if you've never done a tweet up to check one of these out. So the next platform we're gonna talk about is Instagram. And Instagram is a very visual focused platform where you are using uh, photographs and video to share um, parts of your life. And 
what I like to recommend is use this as a way to document your genealogy progress. You know, you know, did you break through a brick wall? Maybe share that record that you found and, you know, add a caption on, you know, I, I, I finally found John's father or something like that. Uh, or maybe you went to a cemetery and you found a headstone that you really took really like seeing or, you know, if even better, if it was in your family, you know, take some video and some pictures and, and share that and, and show like what you're working on. Um, uh, something that we tried to do at one of the nonprofits that I, I, I'm on the board for, and I'll talk a little about later, is we tried to do a next gen in action. And the idea being trying to capture, um, you know, people using, going out and using uh, technology and, you know, going about and doing genealogy, whether they're in the archives or they're out in a cemetery or a library, and just show them actually doing something in action um, with their genealogy. So sometimes you can see a lot of events like that. And similar to what we saw with GenChat, there are campaigns like the Genealogy Photo a Day. And it's very similar to like what Amy does for 52 Ancestors in that you get a daily prompt to share a photograph. So I'm gonna show an example of what I did for Genealogy of Photo a Day a few years back. So this here is actually my paternal great-grandfather, uh, Thomas Corcoran. Um, and this actually is his passport application photo that I was able to find. And I wanted to share it. Um, and the idea was, it was supposed to be, uh, the hashtag was starts with T. So you had, so the idea was use something that started with T. So in this case, uh, I used Thomas. So the idea was Thomas Corker and here I am here. And I posted this picture and I tried to give a little more information to go along with it. I didn't want to just say, okay, here's Thomas. I wanted to at least say who he was. So this is my paternal great grandfather. So now you know a relationship. And I shared a little more. I shared that, you know, he looks like my dad. Okay, so we know the paternal life. I didn't already say that. And I even give a little bio. I say he was born in Dillonstown, Ireland. And I use the hashtags on those. And came to New York City in 1907. And then I added several other hashtags. So hashtag genealogy, family history, and like I mentioned, Dillonstown and Ireland were also in hashtags. And the reason why I do that is sometimes I find that if you have a very unique hashtag, like a name or something, you never know who's looking at some of these posts if you could find someone that also shares someone in this particular small town in Ireland. So I'm hoping that you all get some more hits with that one. So, 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 what, so what you saw here was I'm really trying to use uh, the five W's to give a photo contact and tell a story. So similar to what you've seen in like in doing media class in school. So who, what, where, when, why, you know, try to explain what's going on here. So you can give us some context about why this photo is important to you. The next platform we're going to talk about is Pinterest. So, um, so now we're going to talk about why, why do we use Pinterest for genealogy? And the biggest reason why I use it is it is the newest way to bookmark. So typically today we would go into a browser and we would just go ahead and click the star icon or add to our bookmarks a list of different websites or articles that we want to take a look at for later. But Pinterest is now the, the newest way to actually keep track of all the different things that you want to, uh, you want to read later or different things to investigate. It's a nice way to organize what you have in your genealogy. And these could be as simple as here are a list of genealogy resources, or maybe you even have like a bunch of photographs for a particular surname. You could even make a board, as, we, as they call it, just for that particular surname. And then if someone went and searched on your name and then they found those boards, maybe you'd find a cousin in the process. And what's nice about Pinterest is that you don't have to follow everybody's board. So if you don't want to see all the places that they want to visit over the world and in their house, you could just look at just the genealogy boards and move on from there. So I'm going to show an example of what my Pinterest boards look like. And there's still some a, somewhat a work in progress. Um, so I have a general one for genealogy where I share um, some like photograph hints. I have some ones on like death certificate uh, numbers. So if you want to, you know, decipher those death certificates, um, old occupations. Uh, the next one I have is around genealogy blog posts. So different posts that I have put on my blog and shared, um, even including a copy of my business card and that I add here. And this lovely tree here is actually uh, from a blog post where I created my uh, grandmother's uh, Irish soda bread scones that was actually passed down from her mother. So it was a family recipe as part of it. 
And then I even like, you know, created a board on antique store finds. Uh, so something that I like to do every now and then when I travel is I try to go into the nearest antique store and rescue some orphan documents. So in one case, I actually went to uh, Corning, New York when I was um, at my previous job and I actually found someone's wedding picture there. And it was a gorgeous picture, as you can see here. She has a lovely, uh, lovely long veil and dress here. And, their, and it was kind of sad. Their picture was in an antique store. My hope is that I want to reunite that. I also found a couple other documents uh, around uh, some of the uh, uh, fraternal mason organizations and even like a, a death prayer guard. So these are the kind of things that you can find and you could use this as a way to kind of advertise what you have and maybe even get in touch with someone to reunite those items. Okay. Uh, the last platform we're gonna talk about for social media is YouTube. And YouTube has been growing so much over the years now that more users are turning to uh, vlogging or video logging uh, their, their lives, their travel to, to share. And genealogy is no stranger to this. There's a growing number of vloggers um, on, on the scene that are sharing different things that they're working on. Um, I have a number of friends that are sharing different tips and tricks um, online and posting those videos on social media to help you with a particular topic. Um, for example, one of my one of my good friends, uh, Melissa Finley, she's been sharing a lot of videos recently on how to find tips and tricks in different census records. So it could be a quick way to, um, you know, gain some tips um, just watching a video um, right from home, and you can apply that to your genealogy. Now, with this, um, because it's it's original video content, you actually can contribute your own content. You can create your own channel, as they call it. So if someone wants to tune in to you and see any of your updates, you can actually share some of the videos you've created. And you can also have users subscribe to those channels um, to receive updates. So you can let people know that if you're having a particular uh, genealogy niche out there or uh, cemetery travels, you can let them know, um, you know that they can tune in and every anytime you post an update. Now, if you want an idea of some of the channels that I kind of tune into, um, one obviously is um, our Next Gen Genealogy Network, which I mentioned I'm part of the board for. So we actually interview other genealogists, both professional and amateur, and just try to you know learn more about their lives. And it's it's real time Q and A interview, so it's a very different style um, that we don't see a lot of times. We also see a lot of videos from places like the U.S. National Archives. Um, they will actually. Uh, film their meetings. So you may see something about like different meetings and collections coming on or a new exhibit where there's videos on there. And um, there's also uh, videos being offered through people like Krista Cowan, uh, known as the Barefoot Genealogist through Ancestry.com, where she shares a lot of, you know, new updates and tips and tricks on Ancestry. And some of my friends at Family History Fin actually, they like to share um, their own tips as well, um, looking at a particular topic. And, and usually a lot of these videos are a lot of fun. Um, people, are, people that really do this, they really enjoy what they do when, when they share with everybody. And one thing to think about when you are doing uh, these videos is think about ways how you can use YouTube. So maybe you want to live stream like your family reunion for people that can't make it. Um, or maybe even like attend a wedding virtually. Um, that was an option that I started seeing some of my friends recently do is that if someone couldn't attend out of town, they actually would live stream the video on, on a wedding on YouTube and people could actually watch the ceremony and feel a part of their day. So here's an example of a YouTube channel, and this is run by the Geological Society of Ireland. And as you can see here, they have a couple of talks around um, Roman Catholic records um, and a couple of their meetings here. So this is a way that um, societies can actually share some of the content that's going on um, in, in their day to day and share with others. So it's a way to also help uh, uh, keep down on cost. If a speaker's ever brought in, if they're able to ever um, have a um, someone present either virtually or even just live stream it, they could actually share with their members um, a way to have viewers view at home uh, to go to that if they don't have the meeting space to meet up. Okay, so now that we've talked all social media, we're now going to move on to DNA. And DNA, as you know, has been growing so much over the years. So let's talk about why you should use DNA. Now, this is only a small uh, number of reasons why, why I believe you should use it. There's, there's many others, but these are the most popular ones we see in genealogy. Um, most common one we receive a lot is you want to know your ancestral origins. You want to know where in Ireland or England, 
uh, Scotland or any other country your family comes from. You want to know more about where that family line descends from. And in some cases, DNA is really where we need to turn to help answer that question when the paper trail runs out. So it can be a really valuable tool when you're when you're going out and you know using items like Y DNA to go all the way back on it, like a male line, for example. It's also a way just to confirm lines of descent to see if you are if you have the right uh, parents in a particular case. It can help you see if you have the right mother and father attributed to a particular couple based on the DNA that's shared. So especially when you get into the more recent generations, um, it's a great way to cross check your work to see if does the paper trail match up with the DNA trail. And it's also another way to test hypotheses within your family tree. So maybe you have an idea that someone could be the father of a particular ancestor of yours, you can actually, you know, connect with other other matches and other people that should descend from the other line and test them and see if there you do share a common ancestor and see if if it makes sense based on that relationship. And of course, with, with DNA, you also have a a whole slew of cousins that are out there, and you actually might be able to connect with other cousins that are also genealogists that are researching. I've I've actually encountered uh, quite a number over the years. I've been testing my DNA over six years ago, I believe, when I started, and I've connected with so many cousins, and we just keep adding to it. So think about it. DNA is just another uh, another tool to use. So one of the most popular um, items that is being used is what we call family tree DNA study projects. And these are offered through Family Tree DNA, which is a company. And these surname projects allow you to connect with others that share the same surname. So if you have a particular surname, so let's say Jones, you can actually have the DNA um, from your kid or someone else you manage uploaded into that study project so then you could actually compare your results. And what's nice is that you can, you're just comparing with people that are in a particular group. So they're, they're interested in that particular surname to help advance that research. And you'll find that a lot of the administrators are very helpful and they wanna help you figure out you know, where your origins are and how to connect with others. Now, most of these are gonna be Y DNA based, and that's because if they're trying to follow the straight uh, male, male paternal line, they do require the use of Y DNA. So, in, so unfortunately, that means only males could take the Y DNA test to in, in order to participate in some of these groups. However, there are some groups that do allow the use of mitochondrial DNA and autosomal DNA. So you'll wanna view the project to see what their requirements are. And some of these groups, particularly with the Y DNA, the mitochondrial, they will require you to have a certain number of markers to participate. And the reason why is they want that information to be um, to be to be as uh, to be more accurate as possible. If less markers are tested, then the information may not be as reliable than if you had gone up a little bit. Now, in addition to surname projects, you also can join geographical projects. So for example, there's a very large one called the Ulster Heritage DNA Project. And I believe they have over 3,600 members. So if you ever wanted to connect with others that are also from the, from the Ulster uh, province of, of uh, Ireland, you can actually connect with them and, and help contribute that DNA. And the idea is they want to explore uh, more of the diaspora and, and, the, and the overall community and migration of that group from Ireland. So if you wanted to know how you can find some of these groups, you can go to familytreedna.com. Um, my group join, as you see at the bottom of the URL, uh, bottom URL at the bottom. Um, and you can actually then go through the surname projects up here. And you can also filter down here into either the Y DNA, uh, the mitochondrial DNA, and the dual geographical projects. So the surname projects are gonna be you know, the first letter of your surname. And then the Y DNA, the geographical products are gonna be focused more on the area you're looking at. So if you're looking for Ireland, you're gonna look at I, for example. So it's a great way just to browse and see what's available and to see if that's another way to help you with your research project. Another platform that's come on the scene for, uh, several years ago is a site that's called JetMatch. And it's one that you've probably heard a lot about in the news. So JetMatch is, a site that allows you to upload DNA 
from multiple DNA testing companies. So whether you tested an Ancestry, Family Tree, 23andMe, MyHeritage, Living DNA, et cetera, the list goes on as we add more and more companies. So because it allows uploads from various companies, you don't necessarily need to test at every company if you, if you can't afford it, for example. Um, or you just don't want to put your DNA in multiple pools. You can actually go into GEDmatch, and I'll show some screens what it looks like, and you can actually see DNA matches across different DNA companies. So even if you only tested at Ancestry, for example, you could go in and you could see your matches that also uploaded at GEDmatch and tested at, let's say, Family Tree DNA or 23andMe. And then you can you can correspond with those users to then collaborate without actually having to test at those companies. So, and GEDmatch is a free website. Uh, there are uh, premium tools you can opt into, but yeah, for the most part, most of the site is completely free. Um, now, as I mentioned, there was some privacy concerns with GEDmatch. So when you do log in, you want to make sure you have your profile set up and you want to make sure that it's set to the right settings. Um, so for example, one of the settings that was in the news recently was the use of law enforcement access to GEDmatch. Now, you don't have to opt into it, so you'll want to make sure that you have your profile set up to address whether you want to opt in to uh, assist law enforcement if they were going to you know, look for a particular person um, in the database, or if you want to completely, completely opt it out, you don't, have to, you don't have to be opted in for them to see your kit. Now, there's multiple free tools available, and we're going to show um, one of the main tools here, one to many in it shortly. So, but so these are just a couple free, uh, free ones that I like to recommend, uh, the one to many, the one to one, and the phasing. So let's go to the next screen and talk a little about those. So this is a screenshot of what some of the tools are available. So as I mentioned, this is the list of uh, free tools here. The, there are some premium ones that are not shown here, but that can be added on. And they focus more on like triangulation and uh, matching segment search. So getting really into more detailed analysis of how to look at your DNA. So the most common ones you're gonna see are gonna be the one-to-many or the one-to-one. -one. So one-to-many, means that you can actually, uh, when you upload your DNA from another company, a testing company, you actually can, you're gonna get a kit number. And when you get the kit number, you run what's called one to many, and you can see all the different matches that compare against you against that kit number that are in GEDmatch. So, and I'll show you in a minute what that looks like. And it's a really great tool to see all the different people that you might want to reach out to and, and look into. And there's some really good information that's already been captured in there. The next one is the one-to-one. -one. So the one-to-one -one means if you have a particular kit number that someone provides you, you could just look at, do you share any DNA with that person by running your kit number against their kit number? And then you'll see if there's no match at all, it'll tell you there's no match. Or if it does match, it'll tell you approximately how much DNA you share. So that'll be key to see maybe how closely related you are. And then there's the phasing tool, which you don't see here, but I want to talk a little about the phasing tool. So the phasing tool allows you to create a kit when you have, particularly for parents, when, when, a, when one parent is uh, not around to test or will not take a test. So for example, I tested my DNA, my father tested his DNA, my mother wasn't quite interested. She said she will do it at some point, but it hasn't come yet. So in the meantime, I was actually able to, because I had my DNA and my father's DNA in GEDmatch, I actually was able to create a phased kit for my mother. And what it does is it basically looks at the DNA I got from my father and that all the DNA that I didn't get from my father, it basically attributes to my mother in a separate kit number. So it's kind of a nice way to help recreate a kit where we might not have a particular sample based on using you know, yourself or a child of someone and the parent. So let's look at that one-to-many tool to look a little further. So it's, a little, it's gonna be blurred out here, some information for privacy, but basically what happens here is your kit number would be up on this top toolbar here. And, and you would be able to then go ahead and click search. Um, I recommend keeping the defaults uh, the same here, uh, just to make sure it's a useful match. And what you get is you get a list of matches here. So you'll get their kit number, 
you'll get their name or alias. So you don't have to use your legal name, you could just use an alias, um, and your email address that you want to be contacted at. A lot of users I know will typically use a genealogy email versus maybe more of a primary email they use for um, their, um, their, their bills or any other purposes. And then what happens here is that there's an indication of if there's any kind of a GEDCOM file or a Wikitree link in this column here. So that can give you an idea of maybe what their family tree looks like to help assist you with that. It'll tell you how old the match is. So how long have they been in GEDmatch? So is it a recent uh, match or have they been in a while? Um, you'll get into what their, what their sex is. Are they female? Are they male? The total number of DNA is really going to be crucial. So your, your closest matches are going to have the highest number of what we call centimorgans, and they're going to be at the very top, and then they're going to go down there and lower down. So that's going to be key when you're looking at relationships. You want to look at the largest total number of centimorgans each year. Okay. So let's talk about DNA Painter next. So DNA Painter is a fun way to take some of this centimorgan and the mathematical part of DNA, and it makes it in a very visual way to understand it. And what's happening is you're basically painting your segments a particular color of your matches to help see where there's patterns in different clusters of your family. And what's great about DNA Painter is that you can use your uploads from GEDmatch or 23andMe, MyHeritage, and Family Tree. But you have to make sure it has what we call the segment data or like the, the information from the chromosome browser. So unfortunately, Ancestry does not have this chromosome information. So you want to make sure you use another site or upload your Ancestry kit to GEDmatch at least temporarily to get the, the download for this. So let's look at what we mean by painting chromosomes. So this is a portion of my chromosomes here. And as you can see, I have more than one for each chromosome number. So this is this number corresponds with your chromosome number. And you'll see here all these different colors. So I started with mapping out my mom in pink, and my dad is like in this like uh, light green. And so I started with them first. And so you know, based on I have my father's kit and my mother's face kit. Okay, we figured out what you know where that comes through. And then I started to add in other family members. So I was able to add in because my father um, is from the Corcoran side. I was able to map my aunt and his cousins and figure out, okay, here is the couple that corresponds to my grandparents, uh, Rose Corcoran and Michael Darty. And then I was able to look at uh, people that were then in more of the generation of my grandmother, uh, Thomas Corcoran and Bridges Connolly. So we're, we're using our known paper trail ancestors to map out different people. So what I'm doing is I'm identifying different cousins that I know how I relate to them and what lines, and I'm basically assigning them into a family group. And by assigning them into a family group, you're getting a specific color, so it's easier to visualize. And the reason why this is important is that if I get a unknown match that I have absolutely no idea how I match, I can basically take that, the DNA painter will then overlay it over my chromosomes I already have, and I could visually see where do I share DNA with the unknown person against what I already have mapped. So I can start to see if do I have people that relate more on the Corcoran side, or are they showing up on my Jewish side through the Seagulls and Goldmans, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a nice way to, to find a way to figure out your relationships um, if, you're, if you don't want to get into the mathematical part, you can basically just overlay it and start to look visually where you start to see um, that overlap. So one tip I have here is, as I've done here, is you want to make sure you test close relatives and paint their segments so you can separate out your paternal and your maternal matches, because this will help you make sure you're successful, especially if both parents might have similar ancestry. You'll want to make sure you clearly know how each match is related to you to make it easier before you start getting into unknown matches. Now, if you want a visual on how much DNA you share with a particular person, I recommend using the Shared Centimorgan Project, the Shared CM Project here. And what's nice about it is that it shows you, and then it shows all the different relationships um, that exist by generation in the table, and it gives you a range here. 
So here's a case of where here's myself and a parent. So the average number of centimorgans is about a little under 3,500. Now this range can go from about, about a little over 3,300 to about 3,700. And obviously there's gonna be some outliers, you could be slightly under, but generally this is the range that you would find for a parent. Now most DNA companies will be very good where it's, if you have a, DNA, a parent or child match, it's very definitively gonna tell you the relationship is parent-child. But when you start to get beyond that, you start to need to look at charts like this to figure out what are the possibilities because there are some cases where some, some look a little too close, like an aunt and uncle can look very close to, you know, like a half sibling, for example. It, it's, only, it's only slightly off the amount of uh, centimorgans. So you really need to use your paper trail and, your, and in the amount of DNA to figure out these relationships. And what I really like about this tool that within DNA Painter is that there actually is a spot and it's not on here, but you can actually enter the number of centimorgans you have with a match and it will give you the probability of relationships with the highest one at the top. So it will give you an idea of like, okay, based on, you know, let's say 50 centimorgans, these are the most likely relationships that you will want to look at for this person. And that leads us into our next item here, which is called, what are the odds? So this was a tool that creator uh, Johnny Pearl of DNA Painter put out where you actually can test hypotheses. And what you can do is you can use a target person and you wanna figure out how they're related to a group of people who have taken the test. So it's really useful when you really have no limited or no information about the target person that you're looking into. And the target could be an adoptee or maybe just an unknown person that you haven't identified. And what you do is you basically set up a little mini tree and you place the target person within a, a, what's called a hypothesis. So you hypothesize based on, this is where I think the match might fit in um, with, the, with this relationship. And you can put several different hypotheses out in the tree. And what'll happen is that you actually get a score. And the higher the score, the more likely it's gonna happen. So as you can see here, hypothesis two is very low. It's like plus one versus hypothesis one here is like over like, let's say over 63,000. So it's huge. It's a very large like likelihood that, that hypothesis one is the most likely uh, way to explain the path for that particular person. So this could be a nice way if you want to figure out what makes the most sense relationship wise is to try out this tool and you know, see what you come up with. A feature we have with uh, Ancestries, which is actually our online tree product, is our DNA features. So as part of our DNA features, okay, is uh, you actually can manage your DNA matches uh, within this list. So if you ever wanted to keep track of all the different DNA matches to help compile all the information, you can upload your information from GEDmatch, 23andMe, et cetera, and you can have a nice list of people you're working through and you could see who you're matching with and if they have any trees on Ancestries. So it's a nice way to organize all the information. So let's look at a visual here. So this is a visual uh, using our triangulation feature where you can actually have like a big, big sphere of DNA and you can basically pull out each person that you're taking a look at to see the information. So in this case here, I'm looking at a match and I'm looking at all their chromosome information. So I can see the start and stop, and I can see the number of centimorgans shared by, chromos by chromosome here. And if you wanted a visual, you also can look at the right here, and it can show you all the different places that you are overlapping here as well. So it gives you a nice way to get an idea of how much DNA you're overlapping and match against others. If you want to learn more about how to uh, keep up with some of the genealogical standards, I recommend checking out the International Society of Genetic Genealogy. Um, they have a really nice wiki page uh, to keep up to date on all the different types of DNA out there and, uh, and the different testing, as well as the different charts to compare results, as you see here. And another, uh, another tip I have is also to join the Genetic Genealogy Tips and Techniques Facebook group. Uh, this was actually started by Blaine Bettinger, genetic genealogist and author. And he has a very positive group here where you can learn new tips and techniques. Um, he shares a lot of his updates from that shared Centimorgan project I showed here. So it's a really great way to get help with any of your uh, genetic genealogy questions and keep up to date on some of the latest information. 
So let's move on to some of the online community and communities and resources that are available to you. As I mentioned, we're looking at a lot of web-based resources, and some of these may be new to you. So the Family Search Wiki is a really valuable tool that I use uh, day in, day out. At any time, we can be asked to look at any particular location. And what's nice about the wiki is that it is user contributed content. So you can actually request editing rights, as you see here, and be able to help keep certain pages up to date. And as part of this wiki, if we go to the next page, we can see an example here. So this is an example for the Massachusetts Land and Property Wiki. So if I wanted to learn about all the different resources available, whether it's proprietor records, town records, Plymouth Colony, et cetera, it gives me a breakdown on some key information about each record base, as well as how do I find these online resources. So what's great is that you'll get links to different sites. So whether it's um, uh, the Bureau of Land Man Management, Land Patents, um, Revolutionary, War Land Bound Revolutionary War Bounty Land Applications, and they'll even tell you what sites they're found on and if they're subscription service. So it's a great way to see what's out there if you're just starting to look into a new area and you wanna know where you can go. Definitely check out the wiki. Now, a site that many of you are probably familiar with is Find a Grave. Now, Find a Grave is where you can actually create memorial pages for your for family members and attach them to where you find them buried. And ideally, you've already found them at this point, where you found a memorial and you've already attached them to their final resting place. And what's great about Find a Grave is that it, it's completely uh, volunteer driven by people fulfilling the requests. It is an ancestry owned service now and it used to be a volunteer uh, created service. And what I love about it is that I can actually go in and if I find a particular cemetery that my ancestors buried in, I can usually add in the information uh, with the plot and location details and then request a photo of the grave. So if I can't go visit in person, I can make a request of volunteers the volunteers uh, near the area will be sent an email and they could go in and claim the request and upload a copy of memorial, all without you having to travel. Now, Billion Graves is another similar uh, grave uh, cemetery site. The difference being is that while Find a Grave focuses on the memorials, where you can actually create a memorial even if they're not attached to a grave, so whether they died at sea or if you don't even know what cemetery they're in, Billion Graves really likes to start with, let's start with the actual gravestone marker and create the, the page from there. So people aren't really collecting the memorials. They're really focused on here are the different graves within a cemetery, and you could go in and transcribe the, the, the graves that are out there. Now, if you're looking for a new way to, uh, to, to reach out to others, for genealogy assistance, and maybe you're not quite ready to you know, put it out on social media, there is a site called Walk My Pass. And it's in the same spirit as the Random Acts of Genealogical Kindness that was started years ago, where you actually can put a request in for help and a genie, a genealogist, can go ahead and fulfill that request. So maybe you need to expedite a find a grave request that has been sitting out there for a while and you wanna see if anybody is in the location where they can fulfill it. Or maybe you need someone to check the records at their local historical site to see if your family's referenced so you can make copies of that request. A one-stop shop site that I, that I like to recommend everyone use is Cindy's List. Cindy probably has a link for pretty much everything you could think of as genealogy. You can look at locations, uh, different types of genealogy, and search, and search um, on this site, um, anything in particular you wanna look for. And there's, there's almost always a link that you can find. And it's always being added every week. Um, there's usually a newsletter that's sent out of all the updates that Cindy, Cindy Engel actually updates um, into our website. And it's really a great way if you're trying to look for some new resources to tackle when you're looking for different items. And I recommend that we all try to keep it up to date. So if you find any new resources or find any broken links, um, definitely uh, let Cindy know and through the website and make those updates. Now, this is a site uh, called stevemorse.org, and he's a genealogist as well, and his, his premise is to create one-step web pages. So these web, web pages allow you to go right to a particular record with just a small set of criteria. So what I like to use about this is their pastoralist records. You can actually search on pastoralist records for a particular port, 
and you can put in just some basic information on who your person you're looking for is, what year they're expected to have come in on, and it will actually take you to right to the start of the microfilm, um, whether through Ancestry or Family Search, and you could jump right into the the ship's record so you can start scrolling the information. So it can be really valuable to help speed up some of those steps. You can also look at things like census records by looking at enumeration districts and narrowing it down by that information, and even helping you with some vital record image lookups. It can give you some of that cross-reference information from other sites by immediately going to the information. One final tool I want to talk about here is ArchiveGrid. ArchiveGrid is a great tool to let you see what resources are available all across the globe. You could look at the resources of university libra libraries and societies um, for access to their collections just by searching their locations here. And through here, you actually would go ahead and click on these little red dots here on the map uh, to go area you're looking at, and that will take you to the page for that particular repository where you then could search within it to see what, what's available. A lot of these archives allow you to get copies made remotely. So you're, you'll find that many of these collections will be open to research, and you never know what you're going to find. So I always recommend trying to use this to supplement your research and see if there's something that might be able to help you. So how can we stay up to date with the latest tools? We know that NextGen is always changing, and because that's really what's in its name. It's really talking about the next, gen, uh, next generation of technology. So some of the key resources I'd like to recommend is keeping up to date with uh, different blogs, um, bloggers like myself, um, you find through American Ancestors, Vita Brevis, we like to post different updates. There's also the uh, Genealogy Bloggers Tribe, um, has a number of bloggers that you can check out. Uh, there's also uh, several different e-newsletters, uh, whether through through us, American Ancestors, uh, or people like Lisa Louise Cook. There's a lot of good technology genealogists out there that have a lot of great ideas of how to keep up to date. Um, and of course, your local genealogy society will be is starting to teach more of these classes every day. And uh, podcasts, uh, Extreme Genes and Genealogy Guys, they definitely talk, tackle technology every day, and I highly recommend taking a listen to them. And then, of course, through social media is how we're keeping up to date. Now, a couple of the organizations I want to point out here is one is the Virtual Genealogical Association. So they are devoted on having virtual meetings and conferences. So, um, so the exception of a couple of national conferences, everyone is meeting virtually, and they have a number of online presentations and, uh, and groups where you can get together with other members remotely. If you're interested in finding out more about uh, NextGen Genealogy Network, um, we, we are dedicated to having uh, uh, younger genealogists involved in genealogy, but also just to teach others about how to use these NextGen resources. We're, we're always trying to look for new volunteers and new ways to, um, to help build new tools. And it's a really great community, so I highly recommend if you want to take a look and see what we have to offer, uh, check out our blog as well as our social media. And then, of course, in American Ancestors, we have, a, we have a, a wide variety of resources here at Education. Webinars like these are items that you can find on our website. In addition to our webinars and online courses, we want to keep you up to date with the latest scholarship that's going on in the field. And then some other ways you can keep in touch with American Ancestors. So we have our, our weekly e-newsletter called The Weekly Genealogist, where there's a lot of uh, different articles about what's going on in American Ancestors, including a survey where we ask you about what you're doing with your research. So that's a great way to connect with others. Uh, I mentioned we have a blog where we share our updates. We also have social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, we also have a new feature called Chat with a Genealogist. So Tuesday, 3 to 4 p.m., if you have a reference question or something you, you want to you wanna bounce off us, um, feel free to send us a chat on Tuesdays um, on our website. And then, of course, we have our magazine and our journal uh, to register to, to help you with your scholarship and keep up to date. I want to make sure that um, you know, we can help you with your questions. Uh, DNA is a valuable tool to add as part of the Genealogical Toolkit and make sure you're using it in conjunction with your paper trail to make sure that you're verifying your, your findings. And keep in mind that multiple online resources are being developed each day to help you, so you want to keep up to date with all these different websites and try to use them as efficiently as possible. And most importantly, have fun. We're a great community here, and you know there's, there's always new ways of doing things, and we just want to offer another alternative and help you, help you find your ancestors.
So now we'll turn it back over to Ginevra and let's see if we have any questions. All right, thank you, Melanie, and thank you, everyone, for your patience. Um, the, we'll patch the recording, so if you listen to this later, um, it should be clear and, and all set to go. So a few questions before we end today's program. Um, Jerry asks, was uh, the post that you put on Facebook for the PEI group um, kind of outlining your brick wall, um, was that answered? What was kind of the success of that post? And could you maybe just... Um, Talk a little bit about what tends to be the success rate for uh, for these brick walls when posting to either Facebook or other groups. Okay, well, great question, Jerry. So, so yes, I did have some success. I was able to uh, find, with the help of another researcher, um, a an obituary that was posted in a Kansas newspaper near where we think that Francis died. And it looks like it helped kind of it helped uh, us elaborate on more of the siblings. I've actually been able to trace a lot more of Francis' siblings and find out more information of them, and it's it, and including looking into a lot of his children too, which was really valuable. So in terms of success rates, um, I would say I would say probably about a good. 85% success rate, I would say, but a lot of times it's not necessarily solving your brick wall, it's maybe giving you a lead to help you chip away at the brick wall. So I think that there's always going to be something that's going to help you, but in terms of actually, you know, actually, you know, breaking through that brick wall, that's not usually as high, and that's mostly just because we need a lot more time to probably look into your particular family tree and see what else we can suggest to help go away at it. Because as we know, it takes a lot of patience to do genealogy. So, but you know, I do find that every little bit helps with this community. Great. And Mary asks, how do you handle inaccurate information that's posted on, say, a social media site? I mean, what are what's the best way to approach that, both from maybe an etiquette standpoint as well as a, just a dissemination of information? Oh, great question. You're right, Mary. And, and that's something that typically comes up quite frequently because you want to make sure you're encouraging people but at the same time, not shutting everyone down and saying, sorry, you're wrong. But you're right. You want to make sure that you're helping clarify the information. So you're right. There is a balance of trying to approach people and just saying, saying, you know, like, you know, in a nice way, um, actually, um, you know, this is the case. And, and back it up with um, a documentation or a source. I mean, we have to remember genealogy is very source-based. So anything you can do to kind of prove your point without just saying, sorry, you're wrong, is always going to come off better. Um, because it's coming from a place of like, okay, I've, I understand what you're trying to say, but I do need to kind of clarify that this point may be, might be incorrect though. So, but you're right, there is a point of going with a little bit of etiquette and also going in with your documentation ready in hand as well. All right, and I know that there are a lot of questions about American ancestries. Um, Melanie showed a few examples of the DNA tools that we have available on that uh, online family tree platform. We actually have a webinar planned for December where uh, genealogist Tom Dreyer is going to talk about using those DNA tools in um, American Ancestries. If you're interested in learning more about the program, that platform in general, you can go to AmericanAncestors.org. Um, you can start a free uh, tree if you want. The DNA tools are behind a, um, a paid subscription to the tree um, that comes with other benefits, but you can learn more about it on uh, our website as well as the upcoming webinar in December. Um, so I know that there were a lot of questions that we didn't get to today. Um, if we didn't answer your question or you want more hands-on help, with your research, do consider scheduling um, a consultation, perhaps with a one-on-one -on -one consultation with our genealogists, and you can write to consultations at nehgs.org if you want to learn more about that program. Um, or if you've hit a roadblock and you're ready to just kind of hand it off to someone else and see what they can do with it, you can also hire our research services team. And to learn more about that program, you can go to um, or you can email research at nehgs 
www.ncpsf.org. So thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback as we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings. Any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org slash education. I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.